Hi, uh, I'm Art Bergeron, uh, and welcome to this month's uh, seminar that I do as an attorney, an elder law attorney at Myrick O'Connell. Uh, this seminar is about staying in control, which is a really important topic. When so often people talk to me, uh, come in and talk to me about estate planning because they want to make sure their assets will be safe, if they, you know, if they, especially that if they die, the assets will go to the right people and all, and that's great, and it's important, but at least as important as making sure that while you are alive, you're staying in control of your life. Um, and I know you have in the back of your mind, that's not going to be a problem because everybody's going to cooperate while you're alive. Well, we want to talk about that a little bit. I, I, I've been at Myrick O'Connell now for uh, uh, over 11 years, and I practiced for 33 years before that. Just since I've been at Myrick O'Connell, I've dealt with over 1,800 cases. So I've seen the majority of cases where things go fine, but I've also seen those cases where inadvertently things don't go well. And you wanna plan to make sure that things go well for you. I think that's the goal of all of it. And you can as long as you're, as long as you're planning ahead of time. So for this presentation, we're gonna talk about my friends Frank and Mary. You've heard about them many times. And their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And, and Frank and Mary wanna live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. When they die, they want their assets to be divided among their three kids. They love them very much. Um, and they also assume that their children are going to be involved or will be involved to some extent um, if one of them isn't well. So before I continue, I want to just give you a little bit of the backstory on Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Peter uh, is a um, businessman and he runs his own business and he lives in New York City. Paul is a software engineer. He lives out in California. He's doing fine. And Mary lives here in Massachusetts and she is a nurse. So with that in mind, um, let's first talk about um, Frank and Mary and dealing with health issues. And I'm mostly going to be focusing on what happens if Mary gets sick. So this is kind of how not to deal with health issues. How not to deal with health issues is to not deal with them until there's a health issue. That's the worst strategy, that you kind of put all of this out of your mind. So for example, if, if Mary were to get sick today and she went to the hospital, then um, you answer these three questions. If Mary got sick at that point, does Mary have the ability to make her own decisions even though she's sick? Is she, is she competent to do that? Uh, and if not, is there a healthcare proxy so that someone can make a decision for her? Uh, and if there isn't one, uh, are all of the health organizations going to be cooperative anyway in terms of being willing to listen to other people? Um, we assume, uh, and it has been the case in most cases, that if you're in the hospital and your spouse is there and you don't have a health care proxy, but your spouse says, this is how Mary wants to be treated, that's what they're going to do. And that's what typically they have done. They are not legally required to do that. Um, and if they don't, then the question is what happens? Well, if there's a healthcare proxy, then that's pretty clear, but otherwise there's a real problem. That is, you're going to end up with a guardianship, someone needing to actually go to a court and get appointed as a guardian in order to take care of Mary's healthcare needs. And that could end up being the spouse needing to go to court. That has not been the case that I've experienced to this point but it is legally possible because healthcare organizations aren't required to listen to what a spouse or anyone else has to say about your care, right? If you needed to go to probate court in order to keep control, um, you would need a doctor's certificate of competency. <clears throat> there would be some lengthy, it would take a while to get through probate court. That's been especially disastrous during COVID, but it is still bad. Uh, there would be court hearings and it would cost a lot of money. So you really want to avoid that scenario regarding healthcare decisions. So the question is, what's the alternative? You all know this. You get a healthcare proxy. I would guarantee you that at this point, the vast majority of you folks who are watching have a healthcare proxy. <clears throat> if you don't, you have to have one. If you live out of state, you got to make sure that you have one from Massachusetts because proxies don't cross state lines. So let me just talk to you a little bit about healthcare proxies. To do a healthcare proxy here in Massachusetts, you have to have two witnesses. Uh, no notary is necessary. Um, 
The only limit regarding the witnesses is the person you've named in the proxy uh, can't actually be one of the witnesses. Um, the proxies, as I mentioned, do not cross state lines. If you've signed a new proxy, you've thereby revoked any other one that you've ever signed. So if you, if you have done a healthcare proxy with your attorney, you then go to the hospital, the lady at the hospital says, oh, you have to sign this because we're, as a condition of, we need, we need it if you're being admitted to the hospital. If you sign that, by having signed that when you revoked all of your others. So the better um, uh, practice there is to have your healthcare proxy held typically in your doctor's office. I mean, you can certainly bring one with you uh, or have it available with you. Uh, but have it in your doctor's office so that if they call your doctor, he or she can email the healthcare proxy to your healthcare provider. Uh, the proxy takes effect as soon as uh, you can't make a health decision in, in the opinion of your doctor, and it stops once your doctor says that you can start making decisions again. <clears throat> the question in the healthcare proxy is who's going to do what you want? Now, if Frank and Mary are both alive, um, they will typically, once again, I've done a lot of these, so I can tell you the typical answer to this, is that typically you'll name your spouse as the proxy. For folks who are older, uh, and I deal with nothing but seniors, so the definition of older is, you know, it's up to you, but for folks who are older, you may decide, especially if you, you trust the person who would be, who, who could, uh, would otherwise be taking care of this, that you don't want the stress of being the proxy. That if your husband or your wife is in the hospital, you want to be with your husband or your wife, you want to be consoling them. You don't want to be dealing with healthcare stuff unless you have to, or unless you're a professional. Uh, so in this case, or if Frank has died, then Mary would need to figure out who that proxy is going to be. In this case, you know, it kind of, you kind of would think, well, the obvious one is the nurse, right? If she's the nurse, she's gonna know the, 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 the ins and outs of medical care. But the question isn't whether Mary is medically competent, although that would help. The question is, who's gonna do what you want? Um, you may have a, a difference of opinion with Mary regarding how you want to be treated if you're really sick, especially if you're really sick and it may be that, the, that, that Mary is having to make decisions on your behalf that affect whether you're going to live or not and whether even, even though by living you may be living really with diminished capacity. So you want to make sure that Mary or whoever you've named as your proxy is on board with what you want in those decisions. Um, connected with that, it may be that you may want Mary or whoever to make the healthcare decisions, but you may want to make sure that, in this case, the other children are participating. So you may want to make sure that you have given the other children so-called HIPAA authorizations. HIPAA, you always hear of that term, it's actually called the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. It was passed a long time ago. The bill, as the name implies, had nothing to do with all of these issues, it had to do with health insurance issues. But the point is, as a result of that law, um, you have this power or, or your, you, to, to name people who can, who can, whom the hospitals and the doctors can talk to about your health care decisions. But if you haven't, they won't. They won't. So if you want other people to be involved, especially in this case where you've got Peter and Paul who are living far away, um, that you, you may want to give them the power to talk to the doctor, the power to t have somebody, the doctor or the medical um, professional, send them um, your, your chart so that they can have some information about all of that. Or you may want others to be involved. It may, there may be a close friend, some, once again, someone who's a medical professional whom you may want to have involved. So there are any of those possibilities. And then think about how you want to be treated in this situation. Th really think about how you want to be treated and ideally write it down. Um, now these written documents expressing how you want to be treated, which are often referred to as living wills, are not legally binding in Massachusetts. Um, uh, that's why, you know, when I, when I see the form called the five wishes, uh, the five wishes, uh, there are like five wishes and one of them, the very first one, you name a healthcare proxy. And that, because there, it requires the five wishes that you have two witnesses sign it, becomes the legally binding healthcare proxy. Everything else in the healthcare proxy is non-binding. However, excuse me, everything else in the five wishes form is non-binding. However, that form or your own others, um, I, I know of one that was developed by a, uh, a, a group called the Conversations Project, which has a similar intent to have you express your wishes about the ways in which you want to be treated. 
that they're going to help the person who is your proxy. They're also going to help your doctor and the hospital in the, in the event that the, the proxy isn't around, in the event that there's any ambiguity. They're going to help people really understand how you want to be treated in these situations. Um, now, that's how to deal with your health care. How to deal with your money and other financial matters. Uh, we're just going to use money as a shorthand. So assume, once again, that Frank and Mary have fairly substantial assets. They've got a house. It's jointly owned. They have a joint bank account. Frank has an IRA. And they have, some, and they have a joint annuity. So in that situation, chances are what Frank and Mary has, have done is they've named each other jointly on all of those assets so that it, regarding the annuity and the uh, bank accounts, uh, if one of them is incapacitated, the other one is going to have control of those uh, assets. Um, except for the, um, the, the IRA. I'm having a situation right now, right now, where I have a client, I have a, they're a couple, um, and the husband is, is, is unexpectedly got very sick and can't be signing things right now and is going to be in a nursing home for a prolonged period and the insurance isn't covering it. But the assets that are needed in order to cover, to cover that, all of that are in, fr are in the husband's 401k. There are substantial assets. The only way we're going to get to those assets is by doing a conservatorship, and I'm going to talk about that a little later on. That could have been prevented by simply having a power of attorney. So the question that you want to ask yourself in terms of any of these issues is, who do you trust to handle your finances? Well, there's the business owner, there's the software engineer, and there's the nurse. The apparent answer to the question would be the business owner. But look a little bit deeper than that, right? What is your son Peter's financial situation? What is the situation of any of your children um, if, if, if Peter owns a business, does he have creditor problems? Does he have tax problems? Are there marital problems? Are there, does he or will he in the, in the future need money? And I, I say that uh, not because you don't trust your son right now, right? But, but because I know I've seen the situa these situations play out. People's actions are often dictated by their personal situations. You don't know their personal situations. You don't know their personal situations. You think you may, but you probably don't. Uh, and so you, you want to be kind of thinking about these issues and about who you think would be appropriate to handle your finances when you're picking that power of attorney. If it's not Peter, then the question goes regarding P Paul or Mary. Who can you really trust? Um, you say to yourself, well, Paul and Mary, they don't, they don't have business expertise, but that's not the question. You can hire business expertise, or they can on your behalf. Um, you can hire tax ad advice. You can hire legal advice. What you can't do is hire trust. So you really want to be naming the person that you trust. Now, here are the basics about a power of attorney. Uh, preferably, it should be notarized, not because that's what makes a power of attorney valid, but because, but because the person deciding whether it's valid is going to be like the guy at the bank or the person at the insurance company, right? The, the, so, that, so you want to make sure that it looks really valid so that they'll accept it and usually notarize documents. People will say, well, that must be really valid. It's notarized. So that's why you want to get it notarized. Uh, there are no witnesses required in Massachusetts. So as long as they're not dealing with property out of state, um, um, doesn't, it, it, um, you, you won't need witnesses. By the way, powers of attorney do cross state lines. Sometimes you have problems using them in other states because, as in the example that I gave you, if you're dealing with a local guy at the New Hampshire bank or the you know, Florida insurance person, they may not realize that. And so you want to be maybe on the safe side and get one that's, that's also um, valid in that state. Uh, that you know that you know is it looks like a, a, a New Hampshire or a Florida power of attorney, but the point is they are valid when they cross state lines. Um, um, you or your conservator are the only people uh, who can uh, revoke that that power of attorney. We're going to talk about that a little bit more uh, at the end, um, but also you should know that signing a new one does not revoke any of the old ones that you have done. So especially if you have circulated an old power of attorney, if the bank has it, if other people have it, you may, if, you've, if you're doing a new one, especially if you're naming different people in that power of attorney, you may want to also do a revocation of the old one and get that distributed to those other people. 
Uh, the fine print. What about the fine print on your power of attorney? Well, you want to make sure, I mean, I often, I will often have people that say, oh, I'm not worried about it. I have a power of attorney. Have you ever read it? Well, no. <laughs> How would I read it? It's all legalese. So I get that. So, so you want to go back and read it. And, and I, I'm not going to go through everything that's in the power of attorney or might be, but some things that really need to be in there. If you expect that your attorney is going to have the ability to sign deeds, mortgages, etc., that has to be specified in the power of attorney. If you want your attorney to have the ability to make gifts, that has to be in the power of attorney. If you want your attorney to be able to give things to himself, like for example, in the case of, of Peter, can Peter, with his power of attorney, if, he, if he's the name, give money to himself, that has to be specified. You probably don't want to put caps on the amount that a person with your power of attorney can give away. Um, that, that would otherwise affect their ability to distribute assets or give assets away, um, in, among other things, in order to help you qualify for mass health or other, other government programs if you get sick. I often have this problem occur, that a, one spouse is in a nursing home uh, and can qualify for mass health as soon as he's shifted all of his assets to the other spouse. Um, except that if, if the spouse in the nursing home doesn't have a it hasn't given the other spouse or someone a power of attorney, then the person with the power of attorney um, can't move the assets. Similarly, if they have given the power of attorney, but the power of attorney has some kind of cap on giving on gifts, and this is often the case in powers of attorney, that there'll be some kind of financial cap uh, in order to deal with the state with the gift tax issues then um, the, the person with the power of attorney is powerless to transfer these assets. So that's really important. Um, it, typically, a power of attorney will specify that the person you've named as the attorney has the ability when going to the bank or anyone else and presenting to the power of attorney, uh, presenting the power of attorney, to certify to the person that they're talking to that the power of attorney has not been revoked and that you haven't died. Now, the reason for that is that if, you're, if you have the power of attorney and you go to the bank and the bank person says, well, how do I know that, that uh, this person hasn't died or how do I know this power of attorney is still valid? There's no way to prove it and, and therefore there's no way to get to the person, the person on the other side of the table, the person in the bank who is worried about their liability for giving you money. To give, you the, to give you the money if you're acting as the attorney on Mary's behalf. So typically that provision will be in there and it's in there in all of our powers of attorney, right? As a result though, um, that can be problematic uh, if you haven't notified the bank that that person that who is at, has that power of attorney is not acting on your behalf or if you have any concerns about how that person is acting, right? Uh, if you have concerns or if you're incapacitated and you've named Peter and Paul and Mary are getting worried that, that Peter is abusing his power in order, dealing with the power of attorney, their only recourse is to go to court uh, and, have, and, have you, and have someone named as a conservator. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. So once again, who would the best person be in the power of attorney? Typically it's the spouse. Um, but in the typical power of attorney, you would name an alternate after the spouse. Um, and that, but then the question is, what if Frank has died? At that point, even if you have an old power of attorney, that's probably a good time for Mary to be looking at that power of attorney and saying, is this still appropriate? Do I want to name one child as the attorney with an alternate if that child is incapacitated? Do I want to name two of those children jointly? so that each time a decision has to be made, they both have to sign? Boy, that's time consuming. On the other hand, it does provide some kind of a check. Or do I want to name people jointly and severally so that any one of their children can sign, of the children can sign? And do I want to actually name a third party as a possible person on the power of attorney? So the question regarding all of the, those issues of who you name is how do you deal with trouble? You've named Paul as Peter with the power of attorney. You've become, inca you've become incapacitated or your, me your memory is going. The other kids are seeing, oh my God, you know, we think Peter's really abusing this. You know, he's not talking to us. He's not giving us inf any information. What can they do? <clears throat> well, 
There's nothing they can do. If you have a power of attorney, the only person who can revoke that power of attorney is you. And if you're incapacitated, you can't do that. Um, only a conservator could revoke the power of attorney. What does it take to become a conservator? I've, get, I've gotten these calls from Paul and Mary and said, you know, we, our mom is getting clobbered by, by the, with this other child. What can we do? And I'll, and I'll tell them, the only person who can revoke the power of attorney is your mother. The only alternative is you can go to court, you can file a petition, you're going to need a doctor's certificate from a doctor who has seen your mother within the last 30 days, certifying that your mother doesn't have competence. Then you file that petition. The legal fees on this, on this conservatorship, I put in this range, $5,000 to $100,000. Um, in the case that we're now going, where we're now going forward with the, the woman who needs to get the access to the, to the 401k, it's going to be closer to that $5,000 number because there aren't gonna, everyone's going to be assenting, everybody's going to be agreeing. I've had cases where, where people are fighting over this. I've seen that figure of $100,000. And if you're the petitioner and you don't get appointed as the conservator because the judge rejects it or appoints somebody else, they don't have to pay your, they, the court doesn't have to order the legal fees to be paid from out of your parents' money. So you could end up picking up that bill. So it's a real problem. This is one of those problems that you want to solve ahead of time because solving it at the time is going to be really expensive. Finally, a couple words about trusts. First, a couple of definitions. And the reason why I talk about this is that increasing numbers of seniors have assets, often not all of them, but some that are in trust. There are two reasons why you would have created a trust. You've heard me talk about both of these before. First, um, you could create a revocable and amendable trust. And I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, and, and in that trust, revocable means whatever you've put into it, you can take back out. Amendable means you can change it at any time. Um, it, you can also put money into an irrevocable trust. Irrevocable means whatever you've put in, you can't take back out. And once again, amendable means it's amendable at any time. You would have created a revocable trust, or Frank and Mary would have created a revocable trust if they were not worried about nursing home issues. They simply wanted to make sure that after the two of them have died, um, their assets can be distributed easily to the children without having to go through the probate process. So typically, that trust will name the two of them as trustees, will say the survivor is then the trustee, and that following both of their deaths, one, one of the kids, maybe Peter, if he's the trusted business person, is going to be the new trustee who's going to step into their shoes, take all the assets and divide them up. The question is, though, say that Frank has died, Mary is now the sole trustee, but she wants to protect herself. Well, what happens if I become incapacitated? Is there a trustee who can step into her shoes while she is still alive? Can Peter do that? Then you have the same issues that we talked about with the power of attorney. Do you trust that person? If the new successor trustee has stepped in, how can that, is there a way through which that person can be removed, right? Um, then there is the irrevocable trust where, where you have transferred assets to one of the kids or more as a trustee you're not one of the beneficiaries because you transfer the assets into this trust so that if you later need to qualify for mass health, these assets won't be countable or lienable. Uh, in order for you to do that, you can't be, be the, tr the beneficiary of this trust. So typically this trust says that any of the assets during your lifetime can be given to any of the children so, and, and you're presuming that that's going to happen so that if you need any of those assets, the money's going to get distributed to the child. The child's going to turn around and give you the money or get, use the money for your benefit. Once again, and, and then the remainder is going to get distributed among the children. So the question is, who do you trust? Because all of these players now have skin in the game. They all have, they are all going to receive from of this, some of this money if you don't use it. So who can you trust in that situation? And you just want to think about that. And you want to think about the fact, and as I had mentioned earlier, don't count other people's money. Don't assume that because one of these people is a business person or lives in a big house or whatever, that they don't have financial problems. And acknowledge that people's situations change. People's situations change. So if they have changed, one of the things you should know about an irrevocable trust is that even in an irrevocable trust, you can build a provision in so that you can continue to have the power to remove the trustee. 
You can't typically change the trust terms, but you can remove the trustee. You could also provide in there that if, if others were suspicious of how the trustee were handling things, um, the, the others could remove the trustee. In this case, by maybe my majority vote, you may want to have a third party trustee. There are any number of possibilities here. The main thing is, the point of all of this presentation is, our goal is to have you have peace of mind. That's the point. I want you to be aware, <laughs> though, that peace, peace of mind should not be obtained by simply blocking out any possibilities about what bad things could happen in the future. The best kind of peace of mind is that which, which comes from having thought about the issues, dealt with those issues ahead of time, knowing that even if situations change later, you're going to be safe. So if you have any questions about any of this presentation, um, you know, please, um, you can find this presentation, first of all, on, our, on, uh, on Frank and Mary's YouTube page, Elder Law Frank and Mary. Your local cable station will be repeating this show, or will typically be airing it, and, and, will, and will have it available if you simply want to download it. If you want to give me a call at any time, I'm happy to talk to you. I never charge for advice. My number is 508-860-1470. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Once again, if you have any questions, please give me a call. Otherwise, I'll, I'll uh, see you next month. Thank you.